On the morning of September 11, 2001, Americans awoke to the worst terrorist attack ever perpetrated against innocent civilians in their country's history. The devastating attacks against the World Trade Towers in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., stunned the nation along with much of the world. President Bush immediately declared an all-out war against terrorism. Soon, highly trained pilots, special forces operatives, and ground offensives began the systematic elimination of Taliban and Al-Qaeda operations in Afghanistan. However, simultaneously, another war was quietly gathering momentum behind the scenes within America. It was a war against our own precious civil liberties, and the perpetrators were not some Islamic suicide zealots, but members of our own U.S. political system. In the wake of the September 11 attacks, a number of anti-terrorism bills were passed and signed into law. Although ostensibly designed to protect us from foreign invaders, they in fact gave the government unprecedented power over its own citizenry. For example, government officials may now authorize the use of wiretaps against anyone without having to demonstrate probable cause of any criminal activity. Government officials may now monitor the internet activity of anyone without again having to demonstrate probable cause. The FBI has developed an undetectable eavesdropping software that can be covertly installed via the internet on anyone's home computer. All emails, chat room activities, and website visitations can be recorded. The FBI can now compel business owners to turn over the records of any employee without having to show evidence of a crime. All federal and foreign intelligence services can now closely monitor all financial transactions of anyone without having to notify that person that their records are being reviewed. Government officials can now conduct secret searches of anyone's home or business without their knowledge, even if no allegations of terrorism are involved. Of course, all of these violations of freedom are clearly unconstitutional, yet they remain unchallenged within our judicial system. And although we may not see the widespread use of these laws against American citizens anytime soon, the stage is being set for a future period when the Bible predicts such laws will be used against those who fail to go along with the agenda of the New World Order. As the new millennium continues to unfold, we also see a drive to unite the world as never before, politically, financially, and religiously. Following the September 11 attacks, a number of prayer services were held across America, including this Prayer for America rally in New York. In an unprecedented show of unity, members of varying religious faiths, including Muslims, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, all claim to worship the same God. It is the uniting of the world into one faith which the Bible predicts is just one of the many signs indicating we may be entering the period on earth known as the last days. Earth's more than six billion inhabitants are justifiably concerned about their future. We are surrounded by senseless killings, crime, terrorism, out-of-control diseases, ethnic hostilities, and the ever-present fear of a nuclear holocaust. In seeking solutions, some believe that global unity under a world government is the answer, while others pray for some type of spiritual awakening which would unite all religions. Many cling to the hope that the 21st century brings a golden age of peace and prosperity where scientific advancements in technology and medicine might conceivably transform the world into a modern paradise. In attempting to predict the future, famous psychics such as Nostradamus, Edgar Cayce and Jean Dixon have shown themselves to be at least partially accurate. 
which has encouraged thousands to put their faith in them and pursue similar occultic methods of divination. Today, in record number, people are consulting psychics, fortune tellers, and spiritual mediums of all varieties to find out just what lies ahead. With all the psychic sources available, why do serious seekers still rely on the ancient prophecies of the Bible? Its unparalleled 100% accuracy rate may be one reason. Its claim to be the very word of God may be another. Yet its writings are so old. Are there any valid reasons to believe they hold any relevance for today's turbulent times? I take the Bible seriously because these 66 books, written by 40 authors over thousands of years, are an integrated message system that has its origin from outside our time domain, and it proves that by describing history before it happens. And there are many examples of that throughout history. But today, we see it happening before our very eyes. The prophetic word is God's sure expression of the calendar of history and it's the only real way to foresee the future or to understand today's events far different from the superficial interpretation we get from the news and from pseudo-intellectuals who want to tell us their own theories about it. Of all the books in the world, the Bible is most dependent upon prophecy because the first writing prophet Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that there would be other prophets like him and the only way they would be able to tell whether they were truly from the Lord and speaking the Lord's word or not is whether the prophecies they made came true 100 percent. Imagine any person claiming to be a prophet of God who delivered a message which did not come true was executed on the spot. Anyone could predict events in the far distant future and there would be no way to verify them. Yet biblical prophets were always tested by the accuracy of their detailed short-term prophecies first. If those came true, only then were their long-term prophecies considered authoritative messages from God and included in the Bible. About a third of the Bible was prophetic when written in some way or another. And of all of that prophetic content, about four-fifths of prophecy in the Bible has already been fulfilled. And it gives us a model by which we can expect to interpret that final fifth that isn't fulfilled because it was all literally fulfilled in history. I believe the Bible does contain a warning to the human race. And I believe that human history is in its final quarter. There are only a few seconds of intense activity left before time runs out. When we look around on a beautiful day like today and we see the glory of God's creation, it's easy to think that things are going to continue forever, just getting better and better. But unfortunately, that's not what the Bible teaches. Sections of the Bible known as Daniel, Ezekiel, Joel, Matthew, Revelation, and others describe in great detail three major time periods yet to occur. The first is a terrible seven-year period of destruction, the likes of which the world has never seen, commonly known as the Tribulation. This is immediately followed by the Millennium, a thousand-year period of peace on earth. Finally, there is the eternal realm consisting of heaven and hell. People's acceptance or rejection of God's message determines their eternal place of residence. The horrifying seven-year period of destruction comes first. As early as 700 BC, biblical prophets warned about this time, telling us that a totalitarian one-world government using political, economic, and religious pressure would attempt to control every person on earth. The concept of a one world government is going to be sold to the people of the world as being the only answer that's going to be there to save the world. Now what people don't understand is this is going to be, be a way to herd the people of the world into a system that's going to be controlled by a very powerful elite. And uh, I think the Bible describes that very, very well. Standing behind a seven-year peace treaty, a global dictator will rise to power through the promises of world peace. He is called many names in the Bible, but the most familiar is the Antichrist, which means in place of Christ. This world leader will be the most popular man 
that has ever walked the planet Earth. He will be embraced by the whole world as the man of the hour. He's going to bring an apparent peace. He will rise as a finance man, a peacemaker, but emerges as the most powerful dictator that the world has ever seen. He will be a dynamic, mesmerizing public speaker. Apparently, this is the way he will literally sway the world. And it talks about him winning the hearts of the world, not just taking power over them, but he wins their hearts. He convinces them that he is the one who can bring world peace and prosperity and security. He's a convincer. He's able to persuade uh, people like no one ever has before. The Bible also speaks of him as having supernatural powers, doing signs and wonders. He's going to be a very convincing act. He's going to be the most attractive leader. There's a tendency, because of our spiritual orientation, to paint him in, in evil colors, and that is certainly valid, but it won't be apparent to the secular world. He is going to be the peacemaker. He's going to solve problems that no one has been able to solve to date and as such will be embraced by uh, the general population. He will be a media man's dream. He's not going to have to shoot his way into power. The people of the world disillusioned with disorder and bankruptcy and uh, all these individual and intractable problems and drive-by shootings and revolutions and the manageable state of world affairs, they will welcome a great world leader, the man with a plan. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will worship him, not just follow him, but worship him. It speaks of him as being a miracle worker, uh, a person who will appear to be a very uh, good man. In fact, uh, many characteristics of Messiah will be found in him. But I believe that, uh, as Revelation 13 describes, he will be personally indwelt by Satan. He is energized by and the pawn of a final uh, 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 scheme by Satan himself. And it's Satan's attempt to counterfeit the real Messiah in an attempt to thwart God's purpose. This false Messiah is portrayed in Revelation as a rider on a white horse, the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. His control of the world becomes so complete that no one will be able to buy or sell anything without his mark of 666 in their right hand or on their forehead. Anyone taking his mark is doomed to spend eternity in hell. All who refuse to take his mark, called the mark of the beast, will be hunted down and killed. He will force all people to take a mark called the mark of the beast, without which no man will be able to buy or sell. This will probably be linked to a global cashless economy, which will be introduced in the wake of some economic calamity. This is not out of the realm of possibility within the very next few years. A strong government then will be able to control every person on the face of the earth. Because when we spend money, they'll know where we spend it. When we receive money, they'll know when we receive it. Uh, every purchase we make is going to be recorded. Cash is gone. Everything is digital. You start to pay for the groceries. Your number comes up. The lady or the man says, I'm sorry, but uh, your number's been deactivated. Then you go back to what the Bible says, and he's given power over the money so that people cannot buy, they cannot sell, without his mark, without his number, and so on. According to the Bible, these seven years will be a time of tremendous deception. The world media will promote this global leader and his agenda. During this period, all religions will be considered equal and unite into one compromised worldwide spiritual organization. It's interesting that this coming world leader will apparently be successful at causing a universal one world religion. That sounds very appealing to the modern mind, but it is directly antithetical to the teachings of Jesus Christ. In order to bring the world together as one, it's going to have to be done with a religion. And I think we have that religion just over the horizon. I think it's going to be an occultic religion. It's going to be a pagan religion. It's going to be a, a religion that will syncretize all of the other religions of the world. We can naturally presume that he somehow is going to bring together the New Age, Islam, uh, Catholicism, the apostate Christian church, and so forth. 
there's going to be an integration, not only politically and economically, but ecclesiastically or religiously. A second person referred to as the false prophet will rise to world power within this organization. This false religious leader will coax everyone into giving their allegiance to the Antichrist by performing great miracles. The true believer, those that are God's own, uh, will avoid being deceived only by supernatural means. Jesus says if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived, but fortunately it's not possible. So the elect, that is those that are God's chosen, will be supernaturally protected from the widespread deception on the earth. This charming world leader's promises of global peace begin to unravel as the other three horsemen of the apocalypse ride across the earth representing war, famine and disease which brings death to one-fourth of the earth's population. Incredibly, the real horrors have yet to begin. Catastrophic earthquakes, destructive meteor showers and unprecedented natural disasters follow, although People know these judgments are occurring because of their rebellion against God. They refuse to repent and instead cling even tighter to their false leaders for help. Hail and fire rain down from the sky, causing a third of the earth's vegetation to burn up, a third of the sea creatures to die, and a third of the ships at sea to be destroyed. A third of the fresh water supply becomes poisoned, while the sun, moon and stars are darkened to one third of their light. In 90 AD, the prophet John saw these future events unfold in a vision from God. He obediently recorded them in the section of the Bible called Revelation. There he describes sadistic creatures not of this earth that come to torment people. Their torture is so bad that people beg to die. As if all this wasn't enough, an army of 200 million kills another third of the remaining population with fire. During this whole seven year period of time, there will be earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tidal waves, natural disasters of every sort, which will produce great devastation throughout the earth in addition to nuclear warfare and all the horrors that go along with it. There will be plagues, famines, diseases. The Bible says that more than half of the people who will be alive in the earth will die within that seven year period of time. Man is now saying, I am autonomous, I am master of my own destiny, I can handle everything. And by the way, he's going to get the chance. That's why the tribulation comes to pass, because God speaks to autonomous man and says, you've bragged about how you can run the world, here's your chance. And he runs the world into the ground. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. During the first half of the tribulation, two miracle-working prophets of God based in Jerusalem tell the world's population why God is judging them. They also proclaim God's free gift of salvation available through belief in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Exactly three and a half years into the seventh year period, the world leader kills these two prophets and enters the rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. There he demands the entire world worship him as God. Those carrying the 666 mark become infected with awful sores. All sea life dies and the remaining fresh water becomes polluted. People chew their tongues in pain and curse God, refusing to turn from their evil deeds of murdering, stealing, witchcraft, and sex outside of marriage. The worst earthquake in history strikes, leveling the cities of the world. Hailstones weighing more than 50 pounds each rain down from the sky, crushing everything with their devastating impact. Finally, the armies of the world gather together in the Jezreel Valley to instigate the infamous and deadly battle of Armageddon. You know, the Bible talks about, in Revelation, a battle called the Battle of Armageddon. It's at the end of the seven years of tribulation. There's always been a kind of a question here because it's described in this, this valley that's 185 miles long that the blood would be literally up to the horse's bridles. 
Now, that sounds at first like it's four feet deep, and some people have had a little problem with that because that's a lot of blood. But it's interesting when you look at the idiom and you understand, say, from my background as a horse person, when we used to go to horse shows, if it rained even a half inch, the action of the horse's feet would would mulch the dirt in with the water and after several passes around the show ring all the horses would be covered with mud up to their bridles. This is describing terrible carnage. This all-out confrontation almost annihilates mankind but is stopped when Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth in the clouds. The entire world witnesses Christ's return which occurs exactly 1,260 days from the moment the world leader killed the two prophets and entered the Jewish temple. The end of the tribulation will be brought to pass by an invasion from heaven. Christ will come. At that time, he will rescue the city of Jerusalem, which is besieged by the armies of the Antichrist. And we will then see the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand wonderful years in this world. Jesus Christ's return to earth as king signals the beginning of the millennium. After defeating the Antichrist, the false prophet, and their world government, Christ initiates a 1,000-year period of real peace on earth. By his millennial reign, Jesus will let the world know the blessing they could have known all at the time had they elected to follow him rather than to turn in another direction. It's a remarkable scenario. The fulfillment of Bible prophecy, the climax of all prophecy, is the personal return to the planet Earth of Jesus Christ. And, that, and all the elements that precede that are being positioned as we speak. Does the Bible disclose when this terrifying seven-year period will begin? As a matter of fact, it does. The initial event which occurred, indicating we may be in the last days, involved the return of the Jewish people to their homeland in Israel. Until the middle of the 20th century, no one except those who took the Bible both seriously and literally ever believed the Jews would return to Israel and become a nation once again. But on May the 14th, 1948, after having survived more than 2,500 years without a country, the miraculous occurred. One of the distinctive developments of the 20th century, and something that's been truly called a miracle of modern history, is the restoration of the Jews to the land of Palestine. In 1948, the Jews were restored to their homeland, which God gave to Abraham and his descendants in perpetuity in Genesis chapter 12. The rebirth of Israel in 1948 was one of the greatest prophetic fulfillments in the history of the world. It was not an historical irony. It was the divine destiny of God being fulfilled. Every major prophet in Israel said it would happen. There are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament wherein God very carefully predicts in great detail how he will bring the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back to the land of Israel in the days shortly before the coming of the Messiah to set up the kingdom of God. We know that as the second coming of Christ. The most remarkable sign of the coming of Christ in our lifetime, and there are many of them, but the most remarkable has got to be Israel. For Israel to come out of the nations of the world has been prophesied for 2,500 years. And then uh, you have Jesus uh, prophecy in Matthew 24 that's got to be the granddaddy of all Bible prophecy where he pointed out that that generation that sees Israel coming back into the land will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. The Bible describes right on schedule Israel being reestablished as a nation and regaining control of Jerusalem and both events happen on the very day that Ezekiel predicted. And the Bible also predicts that, the, that Israel will rebuild their temple. The most contested piece of real estate is a 40-acre site, roughly 300 meters by 500 meters, uh, on, on the east side of Jerusalem called the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount uh, was regained by Israel as a result of the Six-Day War, but 10 days later, Moshe Dayan gave the administration of it to the Muslim High Council. 
And it is the site, of course, of the original Solomonic and Herod's temples, and it is the targeted site of the rebuilding of the third temple that Israel is getting ready to undertake. So the, the potential conflict between Islam, which regards the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the two prominent structures on Temple Mount today, as two of the most revered sites in the Muslim world. Israel, of course, will be building their temple there. How do I know? Because the Bible says so. Jesus says so in Matthew 24, 15. Paul says so in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And uh, John says so in Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Just to name three examples. We know the temple is going to be rebuilt. It has its destiny uh, to be desecrated by this coming world leader and usher in this time of trouble. In trying to sort out how the Jews could rebuild their temple, think of this. The Bible says that the Antichrist, during the seven years, will actually go into the temple and ask to be worshipped of God. So he wants a temple. Now, if the spirit that empowers the Antichrist is Satan, and if Satan is the one we know that brings anti-Semitism into the hearts of people, then very easily this, this fake leader, this, this false messiah, could suddenly withdraw the anti-Semitism and Arabs and Jews who've been fighting one another would all of a sudden agree and graciously the Jews the, would be allowed to rebuild their temple in this holy spot. The one thing they're waiting for is the kind of political climate in order to rebuild the temple and I believe that will soon come. It may be that the Antichrist himself will be the one who will negotiate a peace which will allow them to build their temple alongside of the Dome of the Rock. Another ominous indication that we may be on the threshold of the tribulation is the worldwide move toward a global government and economic system, identical to the one that will be in place under the coming world leader. Historically, people have scoffed at the idea of a world government, declaring that nations would never give up their autonomy, particularly the United States. Yet, in 1946, for example, the American Education Fellowship called for, quote, the establishment of a genuine world order, an order in which national sovereignty is subordinate to the world authority. Actually, for a number of decades, many government and economic leaders have been working feverishly behind the scenes to achieve such a goal. A lot of us uh, have thought in the past uh, the idea of a one-world government, a a one-world monetary system was just something so totally far-fetched wasn't even worthy to be discussed. But with the development of computers, with the development of the internet, satellites, with fiber optic cables, and all of these things, the world is becoming one society, which lends itself to a one-world government. This type of technology is also going to usher in what I call a one-world currency. It's, it's just a natural progression that this is going to happen. And I think it's going to be used in a way for people in the government to maintain control over the people of the world. Isn't it uncanny the way the world is talking about how our problems that of individual nations are beyond us? We must put together a global society, but to put together a global government that is the singular power that controls everything is a violation of the divine order. Uh, when the Bible talks about nations, it's in the plural. God has ordained a multiplicity of nations so that people will not easily be able to organize an insurrection against him. But that is what the new world order is bound to become. We are living in a time when all of these things are beginning to come to pass. The, the elitists of the world, the intelligentsia of the world, they're just driven with the obsession that we've got to have a one world government. And if all the governments of the world would just disarm and turn their military might over to the United Nations, then we could have a one world government where only the United Nations or whatever its successor would be called uh, would have the power to force government. They have this idea and it's really strange to me. They don't want God to rule over them. They want a man to rule over them. They, and they feel safe. If we could just elect a human being that would be the supreme dictator, then he would automatically be a benevolent dictator. I don't know how they can come to such a ridiculous conclusion on the basis of history. I think what we're seeing is a rapid movement 
toward the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. People see it, they understand it, they applaud it, and they have no idea that we're moving toward our own destruction. Jesus said that just as early light contractions warn a pregnant woman that hard labor is about to begin, so the world would experience early warning pains before the hard labor of the seven-year tribulation. He prophesied that just as the pains of a pregnant woman gradually intensify, we could expect to see an increase in the frequency and intensity of such things as wars, diseases, natural disasters, immorality, false religions, and persecution. One of the things that Jesus said would happen in the last days was that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Of course, there has always been warfare in human history, but the 20th century has been the bloodiest time in the history of mankind. This has been the most barbaric century in the history of man. This 20th century has murdered about 183 million people. And it's incredible what the, the inhumanity of man to man. And most of it, by the way, has been done by communist dictators. We've seen an increase in the capacity of mankind to inflict destruction unparalleled in human history. You know, there have been 60 million people who've been killed in the five major wars of the 20th century. And probably another 150 million have died at the hands of communist persecutors. Who knows how many have died in guerrilla conflicts. And since the advent of the atomic bomb in 1945, mankind has lived in the shadow of nuclear holocaust, which could destroy all life on the earth. Prior to the middle of the 20th century, Many of the events described in Revelation could not have been possible except through supernatural means. However, now, with the advent of nuclear and biological weapons, many of these prophesied horrors of mass destruction appear imminent. Mankind has the capacity to inflict the kind of mass devastation and carnage that the... Zechariah said in Zechariah 14:12 that the armies that invade Israel in the final battle will be smitten with a plague which will cause the flesh to melt off of the soldiers' bones while they stand on their feet, their tongues to consume away in their mouths, and their eyes to consume away in their sockets. This is an exact description of what happens to human flesh when exposed to the effects of a neutron bomb explosion. We have to remember that even though the Soviet Union as such has broken up, they still have the most awesome military machine in the history of the world, even stronger than the United States. And the real question and the real danger today is who's going to control that? They still have the nuclear weapons to destroy the whole Western civilization in 30 minutes. In fact, bring devastation upon the whole world. They have over 30,000 thermonuclear warheads with the ability to deliver them. Right now, we do not know where their Typhoon-class submarines are. Most of them are at sea, and we have no idea where they are. Each one of those Typhoon-class submarines, as the hunt for Red October ended at, carry enough warheads to destroy 200 cities. The Typhoon-class submarines considered by the experts as the ultimate weapon. And they had a 2 to 1 majority and still built 30 more, where they have 90 against our 30-some-odd. So why are they doing this? Clearly, they have a an agenda quite independent of the rhetoric and the, the, the facade of the disarmament that we so foolishly uh, take at face value. A four megaton warhead can ionize the whole Los Angeles basin. And when I say ionize, it means you would not even be able to tell one building material from another. Now, they have some nuclear weapons in places like Kazakhstan, which is a Muslim province that have 25 megaton warheads on it. Now the world has never seen what a 25 megaton warhead could do. As a matter of fact, some military planners wonder why would anyone ever build such a thing since a four megaton warhead would vaporize a city like Los Angeles. We claimed victory too soon, said Robert Shope, professor of epidemiology at the Yale University School of Medicine. He added that the danger of infectious disease has not only not gone away, it's getting worse. In addition to the out-of-control AIDS virus and the ever-expanding number of hepatitis cases, 
deaths during the final decade of the 20th century have skyrocketed from vaccine immune strains of TB, cholera, pneumonic plague, E. coli, Ebola, hantavirus, and strep A, the flesh-eating bacteria. Incredibly, according to an AP report from Atlanta, more than two million Americans each year are infected with the deadly staph bacteria after simply visiting our modern antiseptic hospitals. This results in 60 to 80,000 deaths per year, more than the number of American casualties from the entire Vietnam War. Diseases like tuberculosis, meningitis, pneumonia, and various types of sexually transmitted diseases were thought to have been eliminated with the advent of effective modern antibiotics. But today, they've re-emerged as antibiotic-resistant strains, which are again threatening the human population. And we have no new medicines with which to counteract their spread. One need only look at the sharp increase in earthquake activity during the latter part of the 20th century to see exactly what Jesus meant when he said these disasters would increase in number and intensity prior to the Seven Year Tribulation. From 1890 to 1900 there was only one earthquake recorded anywhere in the world with a magnitude of 6.0 or greater. From 1900 to 1910 there were three such killer earthquakes. From 1910 to 1930 there were four and from 1930 to 1940 there were five. Thirteen were recorded from 1940 to 1970. Fifty-six were recorded from 1970 to 1980. From 1980 to 1990 there were 310. And then there was an incredible increase during just the first half of the 1990s when 747 killer earthquakes were recorded. In addition, volcanic eruptions, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and famines have all increased with unbelievable and dramatic severity in recent years. The rise in earthquakes is just catastrophic. For example, each decade outperforms the number of earth killer earthquakes in the decade before it. It's almost like we're getting ready for what Hollywood calls the big one. Well, I got news for Hollywood. According to Bible prophecy, there are two big ones coming. And uh, the earthquake shakes of the future are just catastrophic. Jesus compared the way things would be during these prophesied times with the period of the biblical prophet Noah. In Noah's day, the earth's population had become so immoral that the Bible says the thoughts of men were continually evil. Noah tried to warn those around him of the impending judgment of a global flood, but sadly, no one believed. Could the decaying moral climate today be just one more indication that the judgments of the tribulation are right around the corner? Paul, to Timothy, talks about uh, 18 different signs in the last days, perilous times should come, and then he describes our modern era as far as moral insanity is concerned how the people will be heady and high-minded and lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying the, the power thereof, uh, disobedient to parents, and you have the conflict between parents and children and so on. That whole catalog of sins is very specific. And when you read it in the Bible and you read the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, you, you begin to recognize that we are living in the fulfillment of those very days, the, the attack on our moral culture. I think what we're seeing in America is a very definite decline in the culture into a, a coarseness, almost into what uh, I would call a new dark ages. Dr. Francis Schaeffer, in his speech many years ago, made the statement that we are now living in a post-Christian era. This is uh, being brought about through the major universities of America. It's being brought about by a left-leaning secular humanistic media. The Christian value system has been basically marginalized in our society as not being the basis for right thinking, morality, etc. We live in a culture that has forsaken God and is reaping the consequences. You know, in America, 
in the early 1960s, we expelled God from our public schools, and we ruled that the Ten Commandments can no longer hang on the courthouse wall. Should we be surprised then to find that years later, our children grow up without a moral basis to their lives? The moral breakdown, I think, uh, is driven a great deal by the assault on the family that's coming from the homosexual community and what we might call the free sex movement in this country. Uh, sexual sins are one of the major causes in any society for a breakdown of that society. We are in a moral freefall, and the only thing that can turn our society around is the preaching of the Word of God without compromise. The sheer number of false religions available to the spiritual seeker today is staggering. There was an explosion of sorts during the latter part of the 20th century as Eastern religious ideas wrapped in Western or even Christian terminology poured into our culture. The resulting so-called New Age movement became the vehicle for the proponents of the coming One World Religion. It's interesting that today, among all the major movements, we see a, a, a trend, a drive towards a universality of religion. The New Age is the current packaging of some of the old ideas that originally started in Babylon, but on, today it masquerades under new trappings called the New Age. What we're called mediums are now called channelers and so forth. We see uh, all kinds of movements in Islam, in Catholicism, in, in, in the classical Protestant denominations, and the New Age groping for common ground. One of the great characteristics of the end time will be spiritual deception that will come upon people. There will be events that will mislead people, but the basic form of spiritual subversion that will come upon the world strongly is doctrines of demons, false doctrine. And it seems to be a characteristic of troubled times like these that false messiahs grow out of the circumstances of life and are quickly accepted by people who are looking for something to believe in, something to trust, and something to commit their lives to. Religious leaders from all over the world, including Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, snake worshippers, and witch doctors, joined together with the Pope in Assisi during the late 1980s to pray for political world peace. In 1992, at the Interfaith Gathering of Peace in St. Louis, similar leaders gathered together for the purpose of uniting all religions in order to solve the world's political problems. Another staggering amalgamation of politics and religion happened in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. The United Nations Secretary General asked all participants to return to the ancient religion of Earth worship under the guise of saving the environment. Similarly, a gathering of political, media, and religious leaders from around the world met in San Francisco in 1997 under the direction of the ex-Soviet Union Premier Mikhail Gorbachev to once again find a way to merge the world's religions into one in order to save the environment. The new religion is going to be a religion of the earth. And the young people in the schools have been pretty well indoctrinated with this for several decades now. Um, I think the earth itself is going to become an object of veneration and, and worship. God itself almost. Gaia, our mother. What is Gaia? It's the Greek goddess of the earth. And the world is going to come together for one reason, and it's going to be to save the earth, to save Gaia, our mother. One may wonder how thousands upon thousands of dissimilar religions from all around the world could ever be rolled into one. It may be just this simple. Historically, people who have refused to acknowledge the one true Creator God have always worshipped the creation instead. Whether it be the sun or stars, idols of wood, the earth, or man himself, the principle is always the same. They venerate the creation rather than the Creator. The coming world religion will not be a set of beliefs per se, but an organization whereby all beliefs will be tolerated, with the exception of those who believe in the Bible. God will be whatever you want him to be. To worship Mother Earth as God or the Antichrist as God will seem perfectly natural and logical. 
There is one thing in, a, in the world today that is a very definite deterrent to the advancement of this world religion, and that's Christianity. Christianity does not worship the earth. It's a creation. Christianity does not worship the tree. It does not worship the animals. Man is created by God. The earth is created by God. They're all products of the creation of God. Perhaps the most horrific sign of the times is that many Christians are being snared by the ecumenical movement. They seem quite willing to jettison their belief in God's truth and compromise their faith in the name of world peace. This is precisely what Jesus predicted would happen prior to the tribulation. As the movement to merge all religions into one presses forward, so does the intensity to persecute Bible-believing Christians. Christians who give honor to the one and only Creator God and who love His Son, Jesus Christ, are considered misfits by globalists. The plan to, quote, re-educate or eliminate these people is already in full swing. During the 1990s alone, the persecution of Christians in countries such as Sudan, Cuba, China, Iran, Indonesia, and Nigeria resulted in millions being enslaved and massacred. In more than 60 countries worldwide, Christians are harassed, arrested, tortured, and executed for simply believing the Bible is true. Throughout the world, more than 200 million Christians live in daily fear of the secret police or their government. One of the things that has to come before a society persecutes members of its society is that those people have to be marginalized. They have to be shown as uh, swimming against the stream of the popular culture. And in painting these people as being ones that maybe you're holding back what some believe is uh, the advancement of culture. The call is picked up by the media, it's picked up by the educational establishments, and people who believe in biblical truths are shown to be not good for America, but shown to be mean-spirited, he's shown to be a very evil person and very hypocritical, and as they love to say, going around trying to impose his values on everybody else. So I think we've gone through the marginalization process here in America, and we are going through the demonization process. And once that happens, then it's going to be culturally correct to persecute. Now, in order to get rid of those people who will not go along with the new religion, they have to be demonized, they have to be marginalized, they have to be persecuted. Eventually, if they'll not succumb, they have to be killed. Now, if people say this is far-fetched, just keep in mind, within most of our lifetime, we've seen Adolf Hitler kill six million Jews. We've seen uh, Joseph Stalin kill probably 40 million. We've seen China, other millions. So to tell me that these kind of atrocities won't happen is to simply close your mind. But I see the first winds of this kind of persecution coming in America. You know, as we survey what's going on in the horizon in every segment of our world, whether it's Russia arming its Islamic friends to attra attack Israel, whether it's in the emergence of a world super government in Europe, as the Bible talks about, or whether it's the regathering of the Jews in Israel, the rebuilding of the temple, every one of these details. It's not as if it's any one thing. It's the orchestration of all major themes the Bible talks about leads to a world climax in our lifetime. The question is, what do you do about it? It's interesting to watch. It's breathtaking to realize that we have a message from outside time laying it all down before it happens. But why? What's the response? It all sets the stage for the return of Jesus Christ. And what it really means, it's time to get serious about the Bible. Christians who believe the Bible to be the authoritative word of God and look forward to the return of Jesus Christ are watching with excitement as many ancient prophecies continue to unfold before their eyes. However, for those who disrespect the biblical point of view, 
the nearness of the seven-year tribulation period produces panic and fear. A decision must be made to either ignore the innumerable signs and accept the consequences or respond to the Bible's warnings before it's too late. You know, this is something that can frighten people, but it shouldn't. Uh, there's no question but what the whole prophetic scenario is coming together right before our eyes. But I feel that that should help people see that, number one, the Bible is true because we can see that what it predicted is actually, in fact, coming true, just as it has in history. But I think it also should, uh, first of all, make us stop and think, do we really know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord? He took our place and bore the judgment for every sin that we'll ever commit. And because of that, he purchased a pardon with our name on it. But we must claim that pardon by faith. We must receive it by faith in order for it to be valid. And it's something that must happen by a deliberate choice at a point of time. And I believe that is what is most important for people today, especially in the light of what we see happening. The important issue is your position in Christ because we're leading to a climax in human history in which he is the central actor. Not this coming world leader that's going to deceive the world, but Christ himself. How do you find out about it? From the Bible. Taking it seriously. Doing your homework. And uh, around that, your internal destiny hangs. But I believe right now is the important time to just say, thank you, Jesus Christ, for dying for my sins. I accept the gift of pardon that you purchased for me. That changes a person's eternal destiny right there. He receives a spiritual birth that gives him the ability to desire and want to follow the things God wants him to do from that point on. And so I would ask you, have you responded to that invitation? Have you said, yes, I believe you died on that cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my life. That's the greatest decision you can ever make. over its own citizenry. For example, government officials may now authorize the use of wiretaps against anyone without having to demonstrate probable cause of any criminal activity. Government officials may now monitor the internet activity of anyone without again having to demonstrate probable cause. The FBI has developed an undetectable eavesdropping software that can be covertly installed via the internet on anyone's home computer. All emails, chat room activities, and website visitations can be recorded. The FBI can now compel business owners to turn over the records of any employee without having to show evidence of a crime. All federal and foreign intelligence services can now closely monitor all financial transactions of anyone without having to notify that person that their records are being reviewed. Government officials can now conduct secret searches of anyone's home or business without their knowledge, even if no allegations of terrorism are involved. Of course, all of these violations of freedom are clearly unconstitutional, yet they remain unchallenged within our judicial system. Hence, ...have shown themselves to be at least partially accurate, which has encouraged thousands to put their faith in them and pursue similar occultic methods of divination. Today, in record number, people are consulting psychics, fortune tellers, and spiritual mediums of all varieties to find out just what lies ahead. With all the psychic sources available, why do serious seekers still rely on the ancient prophecies of the Bible? Its unparalleled 100% accuracy rate may be one reason. Its claim to be the very word of God may be another. Yet its writings are so old. Are there any valid reasons to believe they hold any relevance for today's turbulent times? I take the Bible seriously because these 66 books, written by 40 authors over thousands of years, are an integrated message system that has its origin from outside our time domain, and it proves that by describing history before it happens. And there are many examples of that throughout history. But today, we see it happening before our very eyes.
On the morning of September 11th, 2001, Americans awoke to the worst terrorist attack ever perpetrated against innocent civilians in their country's history. The devastating attacks against the World Trade Towers in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., stunned the nation along with much of the world. President Bush immediately declared an all-out war against terrorism. Soon, highly trained pilots, special forces operatives, and ground offensives began the systematic elimination of Taliban and Al-Qaeda operations in Afghanistan. However, simultaneously, another war was quietly gathering momentum behind the scenes within America. It was a war against our own precious civil liberties, and the perpetrators were not some Islamic suicide zealots, but members of our own U.S. political system. In the wake of the September 11 attacks, a number of anti-terrorism bills were passed and signed into law. Although ostensibly designed to protect us from foreign invaders, they in fact gave the government unprecedented power. Today, many of Earth's more than 6 billion inhabitants are justifiably concerned about their future. We are surrounded by senseless killings, crime, terrorism, out-of-control diseases, ethnic hostilities, and the ever-present fear of a nuclear holocaust. In seeking solutions, some believe that global unity under a world government is the answer while others pray for some type of spiritual awakening which would unite all religions. Many cling to the hope that the 21st century brings a golden age of peace and prosperity where scientific advancements in technology and medicine might conceivably transform the world into a modern paradise. In attempting to predict the future, famous psychics such as Nostradamus, Edgar Cayce and Jean Dick... And although we may not see the widespread use of these laws against American citizens anytime soon. The stage is being set for a future period when the Bible predicts such laws will be used against those who fail to go along with the agenda of the New World Order. As the new millennium continues to unfold, we also see a drive to unite the world as never before, politically, financially, and religiously. Following the September 11 attacks, a number of prayer services were held across America, including this Prayer for America rally in New York. In an unprecedented show of unity, members of varying religious faiths, including Muslims, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, all claim to worship the same God. It is the uniting of the world into one faith which the Bible predicts is just one of the many signs indicating we may be entering the period on earth known as the last days.